Good morning, how are you? Great to be with you and uh, wow, there's people here and there's a 49ers game on. Man, man, gee, we've got faith in this room. I can tell I'm working with you. We're going to go to about 3.30 today, so... <laughs> uh, I want to thank Pastor Banning for having me speak today and uh, he's been to our church and great friends particularly with Pastor Russell and uh, we've been developing a relationship but the funny thing is that as I've traveled around the world different pastors in different places Pastor Banning has um, you know you see him here but he's actually been encouraging stirring different pastors there was one in LA a few years ago I sat with him he was in tears and and I said something and he said you're saying exactly what Pastor Banning said. And, uh, and I was like, well, that's good. That's, that's great. You know, very, very good. And, uh, and, and, and then, of course, a couple of my friends on, on a few church boards around the world in, in Manchester in England and also in uh, Brisbane in Australia. Pastor Paul Geeling told me he's coming here in a few months' time and, and he's one of my great, great friends. So it's cool, isn't it? Today you're my church. You're my Californian church. So I don't want to talk to you as an outsider. I want to stir you today. And I believe that we are in an incredible season as the church of Jesus Christ. I don't look at what's happened and say, God, we seem to be taking steps backwards. You know, I look at political systems around the world right now, and man, nobody has a clue what's going on. Nobody has a clue. I'm not on one side or the other. Nobody has a clue. But he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And he's in control. And, I, and I've learned that when I get agitated about something, when I get stirred about something, God is usually up to something. You know, we can get agitated and say, what can we do? Why is this happening? Or we can say, God, what are you up to? Because more often than not, our problem is our possibility. So right now in this season in the life of the church, I believe it's a season for us to rise up. You know, in the middle of the pandemic, we were, um, we were I had a particular season where I was, I was a little ticked off, you know. I don't know if you ever get that way with anybody. And uh, and, but you're all Christian here, not like us in Australia. And uh, I was in a church board meeting. You want to get ticked off somewhere, go to a church board meeting. And I, I was in this church board meeting and they were, they were talking about the charitable arm and how two guys had been delegated to actually raise money for our charitable arm of the church. And for four years, we'd got the same report. They were saying the same thing. And you'll get to know me a little that I am a can-do guy. I hate just sitting around hypothesizing about what we're going to do. I want to get it done. And so these guys are talking, and I felt that sense of, I just want to reach out and punch you, and, 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 and coming in me. And I knew it wasn't God, but I, I, I had to let go. And in the end, I, I got my fist, and I slammed it on the table. And I said, guys, how long are we going to talk about this? Just raise some money. And, uh, and you know how sometimes stuff comes out of your mouth and then you think, oh my gosh, what did I just say? So for the rest of the board meeting, I was sort of like real Christian, thinking, Lord, I've done the wrong thing. How do I repent for this? And, and so at the end of the meeting, I said to Pastor Russell, because I've learned that if you've got an agitation, you need to do something. So I said, how about I become the chairman of that board for a, one year and I'll raise money? And part of me was hoping he'd say, no, 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 we don't want to do that. You've got other things on. But he said, oh, of course, that'd be great. And then I'm thinking, gee, now I've got to do this. <laughs> well, within a few months, we raised about $150,000 for the, the charitable arm from people outside of the church. And then I suddenly realized I had no clue what we were going to do with the money. So I'm talking to the staff. There's four staff in this area and I'm talking to them. They had no clue what to do with it either. And, and it had been the same for years. We had like a food relief centre that fed about 100, 150 people a week. And, and I just felt we could expand beyond there. So anyway, I came into the beginning of 2020 and the first week of February, I had this idea. I felt the Holy Spirit say, expand. And who knows that when sometimes God speaks, the circumstances don't line up. So we expanded. I spent $88,000 on shelving and, and got all these uh, trades people together. And we created um, what you'd call, it looks like a whole food shop. Because we don't want to just give people my, uh, food. We want to actually feel their dignity is in line. And they come in and they select their food. And, and, and how could we do that? So we had all these conversations. We get it all ready. And without a word of a lie, we're going to launch it on the Sunday. On the Tuesday, the whole of the world goes to custard. There it is, just for you. 
That's an Australian saying that I didn't realise. That means, you know, goes pear-shaped. Is that an... an uh, no, no, that's... People like pears, they like custard here. So do I, but anyway. Unstructured is what custard is, okay? For, goes to jello. Uh, anyway, I like jello as well. Anyway, and... and uh, and, and, and the whole world just falls apart. Suddenly I'm like, I just spent $88,000. God, was that you? I thought that was your voice and now we're just sitting here and we're not allowed. To. In fact, in Australia, 267 days we had of lockdown, we were only allowed to go out with one person from our own home. So my kids lived in a home down the road. I wasn't even allowed to go out with them. For 267 days, we weren't allowed to go further than five kilometres from our home. They used to have police, policing, you know, pull you over. And so anyway, I was watching the news two days later thinking, God, what's going on? And as I'm watching the news, it goes through all the things you're not allowed to do. And there's just this tiny list of things you are. And permitted uses are to go to the hospital or, or go and get uh, veg, fruit and vegetables. And also there was this provision that the only use of churches in this season is for food banks and food relief centres. And I was like, yes, I knew I had a great plan. I mean, you had a great plan. And, uh, and so I, 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 I rallied the church and I had all 150 staff working for me. It was awesome. Some of them thought they worked for Pastor Russell, but now they're working for me. And I was like, yes, payback, finally. And, no, no, not really. And, and, and 150 staff. And, and then the whole of the church was wanting to volunteer. I thought it was so good of them. I think they really just wanted to get out of home because I gave them a free pass. And, and I had to sign this piece of paper and suddenly we've got this advance. Do you know we went from feeding 100 people a week, 150 people a week, to over 3,500 in seven weeks? We were all over the news. God started to use this. And, and the reality was that the tension that I felt in October 2019 was all propelled forward in this moment that God had a plan. I want to tell you, Jesus culture, God has a plan. God is up to something right now. You might feel the tension, whatever that tension is. I tell you, it's preparing you for what God is about to do. God is about to move and God wants to do something. This building's good, but let's face it, it's not good enough. Even on a 49ers day, we're packed. We need bigger. We need God to move. You got no money? God's got a plan. God's going before you. God's wanting to do something for you. I'm not saying you haven't got any money. I'm just saying if you haven't. I wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> but let me just show you this video so you can see a picture of what took place. The biggest threat our country has faced in decades. Dangerous health crisis. We're yeah. facing an incredibly... Severe economic crisis. In a season when the world was in crisis and everything was shutting down, God spoke to us about our church rising up and being the answer in a time of need. Empower Australia is the charitable arm of Planet Shakers Church, expanded from one location to five locations, launching our food relief centres in response to the urgent need in our city. Waiting outside the Empower Food Relief Centre in South Bank, this is the queue of people needing food for the week. Most are international students who've just lost their casual jobs, including Aleandra Sewer, who's lost two. She's not eligible for government assistance and her family in lockdown in Colombia can't support her. Here we are without anything, without our support from our families. We are just stuck here. If you cannot support yourself in Australia, then please consider departing the country. But with countries closing borders and airlines slashing flights, that's easier said than done, especially for those who don't have enough money for flights, let alone food. I need to pay my school and pay my rent, and it's scary a little bit because I don't know what to do. There are 600,000 international students in Australia right now, many of whom will have lost casual jobs. Empower is expecting the number of people needing help to keep surging in the coming weeks. Easing the pain in the short term for stranded students. This is amazing. We have meat, we have fruits, we have everything we need. As part of our response, we were able to help impact thousands of individual lives. At Planet Shakers, we believe that the church is to be the answer to the city that we serve. Because we acted on a word from God, Empower Australia was able to go from providing about 100,000 meals in 2019 to cover 
1 million meals in just 11 months since starting our food relief centres. We've had the great privilege of serving our communities in a tangible and impacting way. We are now one of Australia's largest direct food relief agencies and have been able to make a significant difference in our city as we continue in our mandate to empower generations to win generations. So I want to speak to you today about that agitation, that stirring that you've got. I want to talk on the topic of winning cities. We're not mandated as the church just to show up and run some services on Sunday. We're actually here to bring change to a city. The Bible says in, in, in Psalm chapter 2, ask of me and I'll give the nations. And we've said that for many years. I grew up in that. My, my grandfather was actually a coal miner in England when Smith Smigglesworth was held in crusades. And he went into one of his crusades and he got saved and he gave up coal mining that day and started to plant churches all over England. His methodology was to pray for the sick. So he'd put a sign out in, in these bus stops and say, if you're sick, come here on Sunday. And at three o'clock, he'd have a sign. He'd show up and seven, eight people would show up. My great-grandfather on the other side of our family, my dad's grandfather, showed up at the meeting with my, my great-grandmother in a wheelchair and she hadn't stood for 12 years. He prayed for her and she stood up and the whole family got saved. That's how my family came to know Jesus. But you see, we've got to understand that God is up to something. Don't, don't think to yourself, God, what's going on? Start saying, God, what's going on? Because God wants to win cities. God wants to bring change. I tell you, Sacramento needs Jesus. And we need people who will rise up and say, let, let, let's stop looking at California as that, that, that state that's a bit out on the edge. I want to tell you, Australia is a bit out on the edge. But I get a sense that God's up to something. God's using what is going on to position us for what he's about to do. In the Bible, it says this in, in uh, somewhere, Matthew 5 verse 14. I said earlier, you guys are a prophetic church, so why should I even state the scripture? You should just go, I know that's where it was coming from today. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> Matthew 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. I love this passage of scripture. Because it doesn't say Jesus is the light of the world, as it says in John chapter 8. It actually says you are the light of the world. You know, the sun actually uh, ha has the ability to produce light, but the moon doesn't. It just reflects light. So Jesus was here for three years to show us what's required, but now he's left. He's actually said, you are the light. You are the light. This is Jesus speaking on the parable of the mountain. He's telling the people, the persecuted church of the day, people are being sacrificed. People are being hung upside down on crosses. There's persecution. But he's saying, come on, come on, shine your light. Shine your light. You are the light of the world. Like a city. Oh, I love this. This is the church of Jesus Christ. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a bushel. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds, let your good deeds. I want to tell you, God wants to change up what is your paradigm of church. I've been in the church for, for my whole life and, and, and generations before, but I understand that what's happened in the last four or five years hasn't actually just changed society. It should be changing the church. There's a new day for us as the church. It's not the end. It's the beginning of something new, something fresh. And so, but let your good deeds, it's not just about showing up on Sunday. It's what are you going to do during the week? Good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone everyone, that everyone, that everyone will praise your Father in heaven. Oh, I love that. It speaks of influence. It speaks about us becoming influential because you are the light. If we're honest though, the reality is sometimes we've been the tail, not the head. And it's time for us to not rely like the rest of society on people like the Kardashians who are actually living their life according to what they haven't done and somehow we all celebrate that and put them on shows. I'm not against them. If you're somehow related, I know I'm close to home here. But, but the reality is that we, we celebrate things that, that, that literally have no meaning. And yet we have the power of God in us. And if we don't shine, who's going to know? 
We need to become those people that buy back the influence that God has given us. But there is a contention. There is a contention in the atmosphere. There's an agitation. But like I said, when there's an agitation, hmm, this could be my moment. God, would you do something in me? Start looking at, is it God trying to get your attention rather than the enemy taking away from who you are? Because greater is he than is us than he that is in the world. But it's time for the church to become influential. So how do you lift your light? This parable is basically telling us that you don't put a light on the ground and then put something over it or otherwise it has no effectiveness. We don't show up at church and go hallelujah and then go out the doors and don't tell anybody we're a Christian. We, we, we don't in our house put a light on the ground. You know, every light that you put is as high as possible because the higher you lift it, the more impact it has. So how do you lift your light? How do you lift your light in that school? How do you lift your light in that boardroom? How do you lift your life in that lounge room, that coffee shop? How do you position yourself so that you can be heard, so that your light can shine. Well, there's two ways. The first is overt. We're pretty good as the church at overt evangelism. We're pretty good at telling people, you know, I get on planes now all the time. And as I sit next to people, I realise that after a few, you know, goes at this, um, I talk to people and they'd say, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? And particularly men. I don't know what it is about men, but they go, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Next question is, what do you do? And if I say, well, I'm a pastor of a great church in Australia and the Lord is moving powerfully and wow, we have the prophetic flow and you can see them get their magazine and put it over their face like, or or put their headset on and like, well, there's a weirdo next to me. (laughs) So I've actually had to learn to say, I'm the leader of a not-for-profit organisation. They go, really, what's that? Then I say, well, I speak to high school students and we do stuff in countries and we've seen things change. And they're like, wow, that's incredible. And then the very next thing they say, I say, I'm, I'm a pastor of a church as well. Tell me about that. Very different to, oh, I'm a man of God. <laughs> so we've got to be smart in what we do overtly, but we've got to understand that our, vert, our overtness still needs to be smart. It still needs to be connected. It still needs to be developed so that people will hear what we have to say. You know, we were building the charity in the middle of the pandemic the health minister came to, uh, I invited him to come. And part of the reason we invited him is our church was having 10 people per service. So rather than give up, we were allowed to have 10 people. So we thought what we'll do is we'll have 79 services of 10 people. And I want to tell you, you might think that's stupid, but we had been doing live online, which basically was Thursday afternoon live online. Then we'd all sit, you know, in our underpants and shirts watching on Sunday and going, wow, that's great. Clicking over to the 49ers halfway through and just checking. And not that any of you would do that. But anyway, and, and so, so we, 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 we suddenly had 10 people on the front row. They were socially distanced, of course, but in a 2,000-seat auditorium, 10 people after a year felt like revival. It was awesome. But after a while, 10 people was pretty bad and that many services. We went to 20 people. The government said we could have. So now we had 50-something services with 20 people. But the health minister, I thought, if we can get him here, maybe we can change his mindset. So we got him, but we didn't invite him to the church. We invited him to the Empower Food Relief Centre. He came and he he said, you've got 15 minutes and we're talking. And he says, wow, this is incredible. And then he asked this question, how do you get your volunteers? And I said, the church. And he goes, what do you mean the church? And I said, the church is next door. There's a 2,000 seat auditorium. and We have about 10,000 people through on a Sunday just here. And we have four other locations. He goes, wow, I live down the road. I've been driving past fears. I didn't even know it was a church. I said, you want to see it? He goes, yeah. I'm thinking, you said 15 minutes. We're already at 20. So we go in and I've set up the screen. I sort of, you know, I'm a Pentecostal. I sort of, yeah, we're going to get him. We're going to get him. Anyway, so, so, so we set up the screen and, 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 and it's just me and him in the auditorium, 2,000 seat, socially distanced, of course, and, and he's over there. Hi, hi, you know. Stupid. Anyway, that's a whole other story. And, 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 and so, so we're, we're, we're talking and I'd produced a video with the team of two and a half minutes of what Planet Shakers Church was globally and locally. At the end, he turns to me and goes, Wow, I didn't know churches like this existed. And I said, yeah, they do. 
But in that moment, I was able to say, yeah, we do, and we've got lots of people, and you only allow us to have 20. Because he was making the rules. He said, well, what would you do if you were me? I said, I'd make it on square meterage, because we've got a massive building, and we can take care of it. We've got staff to make sure it's socially distanced. You know, the, three days later on the national news, he announced wow. that it was going to go to, to, to square meterage. And I texted him, I said, thanks for listening. He said, I'm really happy. I, I didn't know what to do. But he then told me, as we're walking to his car, I hate the church. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I didn't know churches like yours existed. I grew up in a Catholic school and one of my friends was abused by one of the priests his whole life. And he said, I hate the church. But now that I've seen this church, this is different. You are the light. You are the light. I can't speak into that university. You can. I can't speak into that situation in that boardroom. You can. You carry light every day and God wants you to take it from the ground, take it from the bush and lift it up. And sometimes it's overt. But for us to actually move beyond the overt propagation of the gospel, which we all love, we've got to change our thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You've got to change that thinking. The church can't keep existing like it did five years ago. The world has changed. But he hasn't, so he's ahead of the game. He knows what's going on. All we need to do is listen to him, expand, and suddenly look what God does. What's he wanting to do in your space? So I want you to start thinking like a king. A king is born into a family as a prince or as a girl, as a princess, to become the king or the queen one day. They don't wake up any day of their life thinking, will I or won't I get this one day? They think, when will I get it? So they actually live their life through the, the, the thinking of, I either own, uh, sorry, I'm either ruling or I'm waiting to rule. I want you to get a revelation of we are the sons and daughters of the King of Kings. So in your space where you are, you might not be ruling right now, but you're going to. You might right now feel like you're oppressed, but one day you're going to be free. You're going to be the person that speaks into your situation. You need to understand that God has positioned you because you are kings and queens. Therefore, you've got an area that God has purposed that you should have dominion over. The power that is gifted to those who believe that like Christ who died from the dead, uh, who rose from the dead. Do you understand the power that you operate in? So you're either in waiting, learning what it is. From a young age, they get taught how to speak, how to manage finance, how to work things through so that on the day that it's gifted to them, they're ready. Stop saying, God, have you forgotten about me? No, he's preparing you. He's getting you ready. Your day is coming. Or if you're in your day, understand that he hasn't given it to you to look after yourself. Because the primary objective of any king is to look after those that he's entrusted over. Look at what God wants to do in and through you. In fact, it so gripped me that I wrote a book called Think Like a King. Oh, There's a good segue right there. I'm not much of a seller, but I, 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 I keep getting encouraged to do this because this is a book that I wrote during COVID actually. And it really summarises, I, I, I'm the, the business pastor of all our business people in our church, have been for 20 years, and right across the nations I speak, but there's so much stuff that's talked about the marketplace that's parachurch. I want to tell you God's plan for the earth is the local church, and he wants us to get a revelation of how we serve in the house, but we also released into the market. And, and, and so uh, for those people that don't read much, it's 85,000 words. I, I don't know if I could read an 85,000 word book. So I, for all you type of people, I came up with a QR code system. I thought, you know, I'm drinking coffee, QR code, and now that we've got it. So we made videos for every chapter, about three and a half, four minutes of some of the greatest preachers and business leaders around the world. And in 34 minutes, you can scan each one at each chapter and you've read the book. You can say, that's a great book, Neil. Thank you for that. <laughs> so it's like a cheat for all those people that aren't great readers. But, but it's, to, it's to position you to change your thinking. 
church, we become so limited in our thinking. Well, this is how we do it. Now, God's got a plan that's different. God's got a plan for Sacramento that's different for Melbourne. Planet Shakers is part of your family, but we need Jesus culture to become who they were purposed to be in this region. It's what God has purposed for you. But with privilege comes responsibility. And if you're born as a king, then you need to rise understanding who you are. You are on this earth with God-given privilege. It's time for you to think like a king. We went to a nation called Papua New Guinea. In 2015, God spoke to Russell and I. We were actually on a plane on the way back from Europe and we are talking about how incredibly privileged we had been Travel the world, paid for often by different groups as the band and the team went and spoke at conferences and events. But as privilege, you've got to take that privilege and use it responsibly. We as the church need to recognise it doesn't make us comfortable, it makes us enabled to do what he's purposed us to do. So we decided that we'd do mission and we were gripped with this passage in Psalms that Ask of me and I'll take the nation. So we found a nation that's close to us in the South Pacific. And I wrote to the Prime Minister. I mean, pretty bold now I think about it. But I wrote to him and said, hey, we'd like to come and partner with you. Would you meet with me? And four business people. To my amazement, he wrote back. So I got on a plane with these business people. And we arrive in this country, a country of about 12 million people. And we arrive. And as we arrive, I get a text from his chief of staff saying, you can't meet him because there's been a vote of no confidence in Parliament against him and he needs to stay away at this time. So he's going to send his finance minister. Now, I've got to be honest, and remember what I said about when you get ticked. I was ticked. I was like, I don't care if he's a leader of a nation or not, but I didn't fly here to meet somebody in the cabinet. I met, I came to meet him. God, what are you, this doesn't seem right. But of course, that's what I was thinking. I didn't say it. I went, oh, thank you very much for that. That's fair, that's great. I get into this room with his finance minister. He looks at me and says, you've got 15 minutes, my friend, and I've got to get out of here because we've got so much in parliament today. And I looked at him and I was like, yeah, and I've got so much that I don't want to say to you right now, my friend, and I can't believe that I'm meeting you, not the prime minister. But I just said, yeah, take a seat, sir. Fantastic. I want to tell you, we met for a lot longer than 15 minutes. In fact, every time I've been to PNG since, I've met with that guy. But after two and a half years of meeting him, guess what? The Prime Minister was deposed and who became the Prime Minister? The James Maripay, the Finance Minister. See, God knew that he was the leader of the nation. He just didn't have the title yet. But my irritation actually could have taken me off course. But actually, if I understand who God is, he's taking me where he wants me to go. He's taking you where he wants you to go. Maybe you're in business and you got some agitation. Maybe the finances haven't been what you expected them to be. It's about to change. 2023, the year of prosperity. I believe it's about to change. I believe something's about to lift off your life, over your family. That wayward child, I tell you, they're coming back to the Lord. They're standing back into what God has purpose for them. I tell you, there's agitation, but God's about to move. He's about to do something that you didn't expect. James Maripay stood on my stage. In fact, I'm going to show you one more video. This is 2017, but just in August, he stood on my stage with me in the National Stadium. And we prayed for him because he's just been made the leader again. And it's the first time a majority government since independence has come to this nation. For five years, he'll be the leader and we're rolling out curriculum across the country, rolling out community hubs where we build these places where they can be churches on Sunday, but the rest of their week, their community development, their health care, there are a whole heap of things that we're, we're rolling out. We've just finished our first. We've got four more. In fact, I'm in your country because weirdly, USAID is giving a lot of money. They're giving a lot of money, I think, because of the Indochina crisis. They're scared China's going to come and take over. And I'm like, well, there's my point of opportunity. I'll take all the US money I can get to build these things. Churches all over the South Pacific. But do you think it's by chance that he's now the leader of that nation? No, God's got a plan. He's orchestrating something in your school. He's orchestrating something in that classroom. He's orchestrating something in your business. Why did that happen? Because God's on the case. Watch this video. In 2015, God spoke to us about playing a part in discipling the nation of Papua New Guinea. He gave us a word, believe, 
And with that word, we walked into a country we had never been to before. But as God went before us, doors flung wide open in every sphere and we encountered divine favour and such incredible influence. This August, we brought almost 300 people to P&G to impact the spheres of leadership, education, business, health, and the church. We sent teams to three different regions. In Port Moresby, the nation's capital, we ran regional rallies and saw over 5,000 people attend and witnessed 1,500 decisions for Christ. In the region of Ley, over 20,000 people came out to our rallies and over 3,000 people were led to Christ. In Kimbe, we saw 25,000 people attend across three nights with 8,000 making decisions for Christ. Many were healed and delivered and set free. Throughout those two weeks, our teams also went to primary schools, secondary schools, prisons, hospitals, and halfway houses, carrying the love of Jesus and the redemptive power of the gospel. Our primary schools team went into 45 schools and were able to speak to 48,600 children. Our teams also visited 28 high schools and ran our program with about 25,000 students. The response to the message was also overwhelming as young people made a stand to change the future of a generation, making a commitment to change the way they spoke to and treated one another. In each region, we visited the prison there and saw almost every prisoner give their life to Jesus. The trip finished with the night celebrations in the National Stadium, where we saw over 200,000 people attend and over 110,000 respond to the message of the gospel. Thousands healed and miracles as we stood with the people of Papua New Guinea to lift up the name of Jesus and declare a new chapter for the nation. Hundreds of thousands of lives have been touched by the power of God. Every missionary has returned with a testimony, a story to tell of lives changed. We believe that a nation is turning to Jesus. We believe it will be saved. You know, we've been face to face with over 800,000 people and over 350,000 have given their hearts to the Lord since that time. But that's the overt, but we also need to be covert. And it actually says that we will shine our light so that we, what? Bring glory to God or to glorify his name. The word glory, the, the synonym of the word glory is excellence. So we need to be overt and present the gospel but we also need to be covert and become the most excellent in our field so that we bring glory to his name. So you're doing that, Masters, and you're saying, is this even a God thing? Yes, if it's going to position you so that man will acknowledge you in that place. We've got to change as the church from just doing things in the moment to recognising we're preparing, we're preparing, we're preparing for one day we're going to rule. One day we're going to rise in that place. Not to do bad, but to actually make the place better. Do you know in Papua New Guinea now we've got a national education program that just starts this week and it'll be to all year 9s, 10s, 11s and 12s in the nation. 1.5 million students a year and it's all biblically based. We've just started our program with, 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 with these community hubs where we're planning to plant 100 of these hubs in the most remote areas with technology. The biggest technology provider just gave me free hubs in every place so that we could have a meeting right here and it could go to all hundred of our hubs in that location. You see, it's not always about the overt presentation. What you're doing every day is valuable. What you're doing in your workplace is valuable. But if it's just to make money, you've missed the point. He's put you as a king and a queen in readiness or in ruling ready so that you can lift up your light, so that you can shine your light, whether it be overt or covert at the right time, you'll be asked. And as I stood next to the Prime Minister on stage, he looked at me and he said, you know, in America, they have an inauguration of the President. I've never spoken in front of such a large crowd. This is just in August. He said, I feel like you've orchestrated this event for my inauguration. And he sat next to me on a couch for the whole meeting. Then he took our whole team out to this beautiful island resort paid for. And he said, I want to just thank you for what you're doing in our country. But it wasn't because of the gospel outwardly, it was because of what we did. And I want you to understand that you're valuable. 
The light can shine in here, but I tell you, it's not going to reach that many. But outside of here, oh, we can change cities. We can win nations. How will God use you? My life is about preparing or living in the moment that God has given me. I wonder whether you could, I could have the band come. And as they're coming, I want you to understand that God's going to add to you whatever you do. As long as you're focused on his purpose and plan for your life. I told the first service that Mother Teresa is known for the relief of poverty. So money is not what it's about. But the Bible says in the book of Matthew, seek first the kingdom of God and these things will be added unto you. Do you know she died with controversy in her life because she had 20 million US in her bank account. She had nobody to gift it to. They found the money and they said, why does she have so much money? The first thought of the world is she's corrupt. But actually what happened, the story goes 15 years earlier, she won the Nobel Peace Prize. With the Peace Prize comes a million dollar check. She'd never seen so much money and she'd never actually been given a check. So she put it on her refrigerator to go, well, what do I do with that? She looked at it for a few months, they say, and then suddenly she had this God thought that if I took kids around the first world and asked them for finance, we could do more in the relief of poverty. So in the next 10 years, she took them around and they say she raised over $100 million for her, her work in the, in the slums in India. But at the same time, they gave the charity a million, $100 million. They gave her money and so a philanthropic giver would say, here's, here's 10 million for the charity and here's 1 million for you. She got the check, she didn't know what to do. So she asked someone, she opened a bank account. Guess what? That bank account had never had a withdrawal from it. Seek first the kingdom of God. Do what your purpose to do. Shine your light and watch what God will do. Stop trying to make money for your next generation. The truth is legacy actually means what we leave in people, not for people. You can leave a lot for your kids and the truth is in a week they can burn it all because you didn't teach them how to use it. God's got a plan. He wants to use you. Stop looking at what the world would say and start looking at what he says. Shine your light. But it goes on and you can play, guys. A city on a hill. A city on a hill. The church of Jesus Christ should be the city on a hill. Here's a picture of what we are. We come together like this and it might be in a concealed space, but when we leave, suddenly people from all around can see there's something different about you and there's something different about you and there's something different about you. Imagine what we can do rather than separated but together. I can't reach that place that you're in, but you can I can't tap into that school, but you can. I can get on a plane tomorrow and leave. And the great thing about the organised church is we can win cities and not even be in those cities because God's looking for people that will rise up. You are the light. You are the light. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Now I'll try and tell this story without the uh, torch. In fact, why don't you stand to your feet with me? I'm from a place called Perth, Western Australia. It's on the west coast of West Australia, similar climate to California. And growing up in that city, for some reason it was called the City of Lights. I never really knew it. So I looked into it and in 1962, one of your former US Senators, a guy by the name of John Glenn, he got in a spacecraft, it was called the Friendship seven aircraft. He did that and, and, and he, he jumped in the craft and they did an experiment. NASA in Florida was on a radio to him in space and at 11 p.m. Perth time in west coast of Australia, they asked everybody in the city to turn their lights on at the same time. They asked the schools to turn them on, the roads to turn them on, the buildings to turn them on. In fact, they even asked us to make sure they were off beforehand. So it was pitch black at 10 o'clock, but at 11 o'clock, they were going to turn all the lights on. So they did it, and John Glenn yells from his spaceship, Wow, in that dark place, I just saw all the lights come on. It's astounding, and you can hear him say it. Well, I wasn't even born in 1962, and so, strangely enough, he did it again 36 years later. He did it in 1998. 
36 years later and John Glenn jumped in a spacecraft. They decided to do the experiment again and I thought, I don't know about you, but when something good's going on, I don't want to miss out. I want to tell you something good's about to happen in Jesus' culture. You don't want to miss out. I didn't want to miss out. I was like, I want to be a part of this. But I also thought, I don't want to just stand in my room. I thought, I'll use my jacuzzi pool, which is outdoor, and I'll take, not my torch, my flashlight. So they had this visual of me, you know, holding the torch. A little flashlight. Had it on the side, watched the time. A few of my friends are in the jacuzzi pool. And at 11 o'clock, we turned on our flashlights. I remember thinking later, I was a part of that. I am part of what he saw. He said, when he saw it, it's more astounding than what I even remember. In that dark place, light came. I remember having this thought, was my flashlight even really that worthwhile? Some of you right now, is my contribution really that important? I'm a school teacher in grade three and part do I have to play? You play a very important part. So I tell you, there's all sorts of changing curriculums, but if you're there, you can be a, a stop for those kids changing lives. Maybe you're in a direct marketing program or you're involved in a law firm or you're involved in, in, in the fire department. It doesn't matter where you are because it doesn't matter how small your light is. If we all switch them on together, it's going to be seen. A city's going to be one. Something's going to change. Doesn't matter whether you're over it. The truth is only 2% of us will ever work for a church or a not-for-profit type Christian organisation. So the 98% of us got to get our little flashlight and say, it's important. It may not feel like it is, but I want to tell you what you're doing is important and you've got to get the mentality that God is looking for you to say, you're the light. You're the light. You're the light.